This meeting is being recorded and or transcribed. In attendance, we have uh, Ingrid Jonas from the uh, advisory committee. We have uh, Julie Halbert from the, the board, um, Tanika, Gina, myself here. from uh, NACB, and Nellie's here, and uh, Nellie Marvel, and uh, two members of the public who, uh, who if they wish to speak, we can introduce them uh, toward the end of the meeting. Does that sound good? Sounds great. All right, Tanika, why don't you pick it up and, and introduce our invited guests, and we'll uh, get down to business. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, morning, I'm Danica Scott. I am an advisor with the National Association of Cannabis Businesses, and uh, Mark has called our meeting to order. I would like to note that we do not have any written public comments this week that were submitted to the CCB, but I would like to remind the public that if you would like to make a comment, you may do so at ccb.vermont.gov at the public intake form. This morning, we um, have an honored guest with us, Omar. Or Yasabal. Did I do okay with that? Thank you very much, Minnie. Thank, Thank you very much. Excellent. Who is, has a PhD in microbiology and food safety. So he has a very deep background in um, food, in the safety of food, in, um, of course, microbiology. Um, he understands a lot of elements that are often foreign to us um, in the public health subcommittee, um, except for maybe Dr. Levine, but he is going to bring us a wealth of knowledge today as we go through this last task, which is to talk about the oversight of edibles, the consumables by the consumer. So with that being said, because we do have such a small um, group today, Omar this morning, said that um, if there were questions, Ingrid or Mark or Gina or even you, Julie, during the presentation, because there are not a lot of us here, he is more than happy to entertain those. I don't want to speak on his behalf. He has a PhD, of course, from Auburn University, the War Eagle, um, and also was a professor for quite some time at the University of Vermont. He is now um, a consultant and has a great deal of knowledge of what is going on um, in cannabis, in hemp, in um, all of the different nuances, I would say that we are hearing a little bit about. So with that being said, Omar, welcome, and we're going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Nanika, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Julie, for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to try to talk a little bit about, you know, manufacturing. And I'm going to start a little bit this presentation. And uh, I, I guess I told uh, Danica, I'm going to try to make it not too uh, complicated. Um, I'm going to try to see if I can actually share this screen. Um, can you see the screen there? I was doing yeah. great before. We can see it. Okay. That's it, right? And now we will go, I just put the title Manufacturing Hemp Product and we will try to focus on that. And as I mentioned, I would be glad to answer some questions as we go. There are also some, if you see in the lower right corner, there are some numbers that hopefully is going to appear in most of the slides. In case you have a question that you want to answer uh, or present a little bit later. So. The outline that I have is just try to review some terms, discuss a little bit the 2018 Farm Bill, discuss also the current position of the Food and Drug Administration that oversees most of the, uh, you know, manufacturing regulation related to uh, safety uh, at the federal level, um, review a little bit the difference between food manufacturers and man of dietary supplement products, mention the issues about claims, um, and questions as we go. I would like to acknowledge, you know, the, uh, Green Queen uh, Candies and Korea Botanical for kindly letting me <laughs> have access to some of the pictures that I will be presenting. Um, a disclaimer. You will hear something about food safety regulation because I work in the area of regulatory compliance, but I do not provide legal advice, okay? Uh, there are also, remember, interpretations about some regulations. Uh, even happens after several 
years or decades uh, after those, some of these regulations have been implemented. So you will see that implementation is not always a straightforward line as we may think. This topic is still evolving, it's in flux. We have issues still even coming with terms and how we define them and we reshape them a little bit. And the only thing I want to show about my background is that several years ago I started this, uh, I got involved with a journal, a scientific journal that is still going on. It's called Microbial Risk Analysis, published by Elsevier. And we will talk a little bit maybe sometimes about what is the concept of risk, which applies quite well for some of these, uh, you know, uh, discussion that we would talk about. When I am asked which one I work with, <laughs> I always try to explain that I work <laughs> with food manufacturers. And I use the word manufacturing because it's very easy to differentiate from what we have in our kitchens, right, that the food uh, processing, and because Thanks to FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, we have a clear definition about manufacturing and processing, which actually are considered human, right? Uh, you can see in this slide some of those, it includes a lot of things, even going into labeling, packing, trimming, waxing, okay? So uh, FISMA separating and clearly defined farm and uh, then manufacturing activities. However, if you actually read 21 CFR 117, would be Title 21 of the Code of Federal Regulation Part 117, you will find that sometimes they use manufacturing comma processing as if they were different. But in other times, they just put the back slash, meaning they're the same, okay? So they're similar, all right? Um, one uh, thing that we wanted to cover is the uh, 2018 Farm Bill, um, which is a, a very interesting regulation, uh, and it's the one where we have the, the term hemp um, a little bit better defined. We're talking about plants from the cannabis sativa, you know, the species that includes parts of the plant that have uh, THC content, and this is the delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinoid content of no more than 0.3% on a dry weight basis, okay? This farm bill, really what it did is created this difference between those things that we can see in the left side of your screen that are hemp, that are product with a very little content of THC versus the rest. And the rest, there is the word, you know, marijuana for those. Uh, some states are trying to get away from that word because of the, you know, social connotation. In any case, we're talking about a still cannabis plants that have a higher THC content. By now, we know that there are a specific varieties that will probably get you always to be on the left side, that is a, a low uh, amount of THC. And that's what we are kind of going into it. Uh, it's, not in, it's not at random that I have a light in here and it's kind of dark in this area because I intentionally try to talk about the left area that is where we have more potential for growth, okay? Um, that brings us to some terms. Cannabinoids are all those products that we, uh, substances, compounds that we can get out of the plant, including CBD, THC. THC is the cannabinoid responsible for psychotropic effects, okay? As we said, the cannabis plant can be divided in two groups now, hemp and marijuana, and again, that term marijuana may probably disappear, I don't know. We are still dealing with those specific terms. So basically what the farm bill brought is a removal of those restrictions that we used to have through the Drug Enforcement Agency 
And as long as you are growing and cultivating what is called industrial hemp, that are plants that have less than 0.3% of THC, we are okay. And also the farm bill kind of empowered the Secretary of Agriculture in each state to monitor for that uh, con uh, the, gr the growing and cultivation of hemp plants um, and you know provides for uh, opportunity to create a, a, a farming you know business and a uniformity for trade. It's important to remember that this farm bill does not change at all the way FDA enforces its regulation. And remember, FDA is regulating food manufacturers. So in a way, with the farm bill, we get all of this organization of industrial hemp, the growing of the plant, cultivation, the drying, the creation of this biomass. But once we go into manufacturing, we are still a little bit in limbo, OK? Uh, another term that we have been using and kind of abusing also a lot, especially in the media, is the cannabidiol, that is the compound from the plant, the cannabis plant, that doesn't have a psychotropic effect. Uh, and that product, CBD, now has been associated, has been approved by FDA as, as a drug, okay? Uh, and that comes from a company from Europe that we will talk a little bit more in a few moments, all right? So with that, in 2018, when uh, FDA approved this product, it's starting to go into the direction of approval for drugs. The epidiolex is one. There are some others where you can see names that are drawn of vinyl, the, you know, different type of, you know, cannabi, uh, cannabinoids. Some of them are synthetic. Some of them have a combination. Um, so we see a lot of research that has been there piling up for the last 10, 15 years, even with some uh, specific human trial, where you know, the agency is providing approval, but as a drug. So what is the FDA position? Hemp and CBD are not the same. For them, a CBD is still a drug. No use of CBD as a food or dietary or comedy because it's with a drug, okay? They use, a dis a still the FDA is using what is called an enforcement discretion. Uh, still giving warning letters, it's still telling us about the safety of some other products that are appearing in the market and giving us warnings about some of those products. The states are taking a little bit of that role here. It happened a few years ago that the company had to recall a few jars of a product that you know was infused with CBD. Uh, so for the FDA, the position is still clear for uh, based on the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that prohibits the commerce of products that are dragged into food, that's enough for them to say we cannot approve it. And the evidence that the FDA has has concluded that those products are excluded. THC and CBDs are excluded from dietary supplement definition. Have the industry tried? Yes, they have tried several times to get a little bit of an um, approval as a new dietary ingredient using what is called the, the SHEA, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994. I briefly want to mention that that act, what it did, is created this opportunity for uh, several old, what we consider all dietary ingredients uh, to be accepted in the market without a pre-market um, approval by FDA. That's the ingredients that were in the market as of October 1994. New dietary ingredients can be marketed only after a pre-market notification. And of course, CBD cannot be grandfathered because 
is not it was not sold legally in the USA okay and also we have GW pharmaceutical that brought these products to market as drugs all right so back to this this is where if we go to the right side we have still this issue with marijuana the schedule one controlled substance that's where the state have taken a little bit of a lead over the last decade to start allowing for some medicinal or recreational use with a quite, quite of a degree of decriminalization or not, okay? We are more interested in this other part. And when we go there, we are under SDA regulation, and there are some products that are coming from hemp that have been given the grass status, which means generally recognized as safe and we're trying to find out where these products are going to fit are they going to go into food ingredients dietary supplements cosmetic drugs that's where these companies that are getting into the business are a little bit complex are not the traditional food companies they create they concentrate product they do extractions they use words like tinctures or an infusion that are more within uh, you know a dietary supplement there are of course edibles of course but those edibles all come out of extracting something especially in the in the areas of the flower where these products concentrate okay it can become a little bit more complex because i've seen and i try to help some companies that Created products that are considered infused by state regulators, and therefore we have some issue with the potential for Clostridium botulinum to grow. I've seen some that have been trying to create like an acidified food based on the addition of hemp. So here is where you know the general manufacturing state that we are seeing are the traditional extraction, further purification concentration mixing uh, using the term infusion sometimes the term infusion creates a little bit of a, of a, you know a red flag for some uh, state regulators uh, this word infusion is used in different ways sometimes uh, and of course packing and labeling remember uh, we are trying we see that companies are trying to get into the market and they try to use some claims to try to sell this product, okay? So, are there any products or byproducts from the hemp plant that can be used freely? Yes, those are under what are called the grass notices, they generally recognized as safe. And these are products that come, all of them come from really the, the seed, whether it is a seed protein, a powder, an oil, because it's, it's known that this uh, part of the plant doesn't accumulate too much of THC, okay? Um, or other cannabinoids. So we've, we come now to this regulatory framework for food manufacturers, right? Uh, so, I'm just mentioning the basic uh, regulations that are covering a product. Basically, you want to have the environmental uh, conditions to manufacture wholesome food that's good, good, uh, carrying good manufacturing practices. We need to use ingredients that have been approved, that are safe, especially when it comes to additives, colors. Uh, there are many different type of ingredient that we can add, we can add, um, you know, um, a, a, a large number of products that has been known to be safe. Then we need to pack the food in a food approved container. We have to use honest labeling, especially when it comes to nutrition fact panel, the service sizes, because we want to avoid, you know, um, misbranding. And of course, be consistent with those claims. All of that, when it comes to carrying good manufacturing practices, 
the moment the FISMA Act was signed in 2011 created this movement of the uh, CGMPs to a new regulation. They used to be regulated, they used to be codified under 21 CFR uh, 110, uh, one, 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 ten. now they all moved to 117 subpart B, okay? Uh, this is what we have currently for people that are trying to manufacture uh, food for human consumption. It becomes a little bit more complex because this regulation also got subpart C, that is where we have uh, risk-based preventive controls. That is where I work the most with industry, how to create those uh, and implement those controls. Those manufacturing dietary supplements fall in a little bit of a different area, different regulation. Dietary supplements are those taken by mouth that contain a dietary ingredients, as we were mentioned. There are several examples of those dietary ingredients. Uh, you have labels that have to be truthful, honest. It allows for some type of uh, functional claims. That's different from food. But the CGMPs for dietary supplements are a little bit more complex, and I just highlighted in there some of the things that are different from the rest of the CGMPs that, that are applicable to food. Uh, you have to have a process control system, quality control, production. There is a lot of, you know, these products are made by batches and they want to have very uh, strict control of the batch records. Uh, here, the, the, uh, the laboratories play an important role, as you can imagine, with these uh, products like hemp, laboratories are, are, are very important and they're going through a lot of different methodologies for testing the potency of the product. We know that those m methodologies have quite a large variation still. Uh, these are methods that are being developed as we speak. Uh, so they it, it have some specific things that are more unique to them. So, with that background, where is the industry going? Mm. We are all guessing. This is also my guess, right? From what I see, companies are trying to go more into a dietary supplement type of manufacturing because they can make a structural function claim. Why do you want to sell a product in a, as a food ingredient when you cannot make any claim, right? It doesn't give you an edge. So that's what I see with some companies. Um, that brings us to the te uh, testing for potency that, as I mentioned, has a still quite a bit of a variation in the methodology. But there are also companies going and pursuing drugs, and those are companies with deep pockets that are extracting natural products. Remember, we talk about many different byproducts that can be extracted from the plant. Uh, but are also going into synthetic drugs. So it's going to be a matter of time to see which is the industry that claims the most out of these byproducts and kind of take it in a way. Remember something, if the agency, and I'm saying the Food and Drug Administration, approve a product as a drug, it cannot be used in a food. It cannot be used as an ingredient, as a dietary ingredient. Uh, you can have some, but those kind of unique compounds that have a specific, um, you know, function. And, and remember, uh, this, uh, the way the regulatory process is established in this country, the company has to bring the information to the agency for review for either approval of a new drug or a new dietary ingredient. Uh, I think Julie asked me to talk a little bit briefly about the state. This is where also it's very dicey. It all depends. It's to me is how important the business is for the state. Some states are making quite a bit of business out of that. How organized is industrial hemp program out of the 2018 farm bill and how much it has been fostered? And of course that goes to the resources. Not all the states have the same resources, right? 
Uh, and that brings us also to financial incentives that are still under development. A few states where I have worked a little bit uh, are here is the state of Vermont. It tells you a little bit about what is there, what can be taxed. Remember, in some of these cases, there is a taxing by the state that you know is important. Colorado has developed a little bit of a better website in a way because they have quite a bit of a business in here. And they have a specific for those that are manufacturing, packing, testing, and distributing industrial hemp products within the state. And they cover food, dietary supplements, and cosmetics. I'm not gonna even mention too much about cosmetics, but that's also an area where we can see more. Uh, so what do the manufacturers have to do? Well, they have to be in compliance with the state's regulations, um, get an approval. Uh, they use the term standard of identity that is a very interesting one. I haven't seen that term used a lot, but that's a term that refers to um, a case when we can really have a very good identification of the product that we're selling, whether it's the food or an ingredient. Okay, and uh, really the FDA has presented several standards of identity over the year, probably there may be, uh, I don't know, 250, 270 products that have a standard of identities, but other foods, other foods don't. Uh, so that, you see, <clears throat> we're talking about terms, the development of terms. Maybe in a few years, maybe sooner than later, we may have that standard of identity uh, for hemp products. Uh, clearly labeled, include these statements not tested by FDA for efficacy and safety. So although they have provision to allow for sale within the state, they are also saying watch out, don't go outside the boundaries of our state because you are going into uh, federal trade, right, interstate commerce. Uh, and of course, don't include health claims. I forgot how. Huh? Very interesting slide, then the Department of Health and Environment is what appears. Ah, great. So they have a nice website. Uh, there is a rule making. Uh, oh, we are already in the state of California. Oh, yeah. Well, California just recently also passed another regulation trying to promote more the sales. They have a very large uh, uh, website with rulemaking, regulations. This is the, uh, the Assembly Bill number 45 that I think the governor signed it recently, a few days ago. Just as a gist of what is going on there, it's a long one. Uh, now they also have to register with the State Department of Public Health they must demonstrate that the parts of the plant that they are using are within the 0 0.3 or less uh, of THC. So they're really not doing something completely new. They are just more promoting the, the sale of hemp, okay? Um, one thing that is unique in this rule is that, you know, they consider the amount of uh, THC in the final product not in between. So you can have part of portion of the plant that may be above that, which would be considered hemp. I mean, we would consider marijuana, right? A class one substance. So this is the area where they have a little bit more of a, of a uh, you know, a leeway or more um, um, relaxed regulation. They are only concerned about the end product, which makes sense. You have to have testing, again, the labeling. <laughs> uh, in this case, they say efficacy, because remember, we pro people are selling this product because of some type of claims, all right? Um, it's also interesting because it leaves open to the Department of Health in California to impose maximum serving sizes, which is very interesting, new. I am, at least I haven't seen it before in other cases. So they are trying to say, as we get to know more about this cannabinoid, uh, or you know, we, we can also try to 
put them in buckets and say this can be allowed to certain size or concentration or not. So quite a bit of uh, an interesting uh, regulation. Um, again, they say that in that case does not include grass because for them it's of course, it's already accepted as, uh, as an ingredient by FDA, so it can be used anywhere. Um, also, it doesn't include hemp that contains derivatives or compounds from the seed of industrial hemp, which we know it doesn't have too much of a concentration of this cannabinoid. Uh, interesting terms, manufacturing includes processing, preparing, holding, or storing hemp products. Very interesting. Uh, and it clearly says the manufacturer does not include planting, growing, harvesting, drying, curing, grading, or trimming the plant. As you can see, at the state level, they are redefining some terms that, again, we know have a definition from uh, the agency, from FDA. So basically, uh, let me see if I can go back to uh, here, wherever I am. So that's basically what I have as a, as a short presentation. I, I, as I said, I hope it wasn't too, too long or complicated. Uh, I, I don't think I'm bringing anything new. It's just a, a perspective on what I see with the industry going on. Excellent. I see um, Dr. Levine has joined us as well. Um, welcome, Dr. Levine. Um, he is part of this subcommittee. Um, so in, in pieces of the discussion as, as um, this morning, uh, we were discussing that it, it's coming down to for the state of Vermont to determine who would have oversight over the edible pieces. And um, and so if you, know, you have perspective on that based on everything that you have seen, uh, we certainly would welcome that perspective. Right, so basically uh, uh, the, the farm bill uh, kind of gives the opportunity for the Secretary of State in each state to handle the industrial hemp program. This is here under the, the Secretary of State and, uh, Food and Markets, right? Now, it, it, everything boils down to what I said that, uh, a few moments ago. We have this biomass, so there are a lot of farms making that, but that's the bottleneck. Who is going to process that? In this state, any processing of food goes under the Food and Lodge Division of the Department of Health. It's very similar, actually, to what happened in many other states that have this farm manufacturing, uh, uh, farm growing, harvesting, under one uh, state agency and then the manufacturing uh, under another. It's the same example as I mentioned with Colorado, with California. So really the Department of Health will be dealing with it. In my experience and from what I've seen in the last few years, Department of Health yeah, in different states uh, are really quiet because it's something that falls in their lap without probably they knowing too much about it or being too interested about it. The farm bill revolutionized the idea of the farm, but we haven't taken good care of the, uh, of the manufacturing. And all the state agencies that are in charge of manufacturing, whether it comes from meat and poultry that will be coming from FSIS, USDA, Food Safety and Inspection Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, I'm sorry I had to say that, uh, or the Food and Drug Administration through SIFSA and the, uh, so those two, uh, so all the agencies at the state level follow regulations from federal mandates. They said we will do equivalencies, we will try to be similar to, right? One state that has everything in one group under the Department of Health would be in uh, New Hampshire, right here next door. They don't get money to enforce the food code from the federal mandate, but they do follow the food code in a way. So it's, it's very interesting because all states still use the guidance from federal mandate. 
And because there is none, states are kind of quiet in that regard. I hope it made sense what I just said. And, and that's the reason why I see the states, especially in manufacturers, are kind of quiet. They don't respond sometimes. They don't want to engage because they don't have guidance still. Are there any questions, Dr. Levine or Ingrid, for, um, and, and Dr. Levine, I realize you didn't see all of the discussion, but um, wanted to open the floor. Yeah, unfortunately, I saw only the very last couple of slides. Uh, I assume I'll be uh, able to access those slides, though. Yeah, and I, I don't mind sending also like a PDF form for all of you to share. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. It's it's a lot to um, to take in, but um, I think for um, the Department of Health, it may put some things, and for the CTB, um, into a little more perspective in terms of what is there. Uh, any questions, uh, Mark? Or yeah, you know? I'm just you know this is a complicated business, uh, and uh, I'm I'm assuming that some of the some aspects of this commerce falls under FDA, and some of it might fall under, I don't know, Treasury Department or uh, or, or uh, you know, so other other agencies. And, and uh, it's it's not wasn't all straightened out by the, uh, the Congressional Farm Bill. And uh, I'm just I'm just uh, wondering if you think there's more. Uh, legislative guidance that's needed either at the federal or, or maybe both the federal and the state level or whether we want to be able to make our uh, way through this with uh, just by regulatory decisions um, so basically I don't think there is a need for uh, more regulations more than just everybody's holding waiting for FDA to make a decision to help, but the problem again comes from the fact that we are still misunderstanding terms. We keep using the term CBD, which is a specific for one product, but that has been kind of hijacked by the drug company. And again, it's against the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act to go against that. Once we have a drug, you cannot put a drug into a, a, a food, um, you know, product or a dietary supplement product. So yeah. that's not going to change. That's not yeah. going to change quickly. Uh, and um, the, the the issue is again all of the other drug, all of the other compounds that can be extracted that can we, we can use different names. Uh, all of a sudden, from what is under the regulation of FDA, I see the drug companies being very active. And that may take a role and may, you know, go further and, and start getting more approval. And that kind of explains why so many of the companies are lobbying for this for CBD uh, to be, uh, you know, to be uh, uh, a supplement, right? They want, they want as much of this to be supplement, to find as supplements rather than uh, drugs. And it's just the FDA recently denied again two applications as a new drug ingredient, as a new uh, ingredient, dietary ingredient. So they have tried, because the industry has tried many times, many times. Yeah. So yeah. I, I don't know where they can go. I, I think again, the, the search for new products, new compounds that can have a little bit of a different name, remember, I'm not a chemist, but you know, you see the formula, the formula for this product, they're all very similar. So creating synthetic ones is also very attractive for some, for some, uh, you know, companies, especially drug companies. So Omar, I do have a general question for you as a food safety expert. Um, have you seen, um, with the use of edibles, issues as it relates to the manufacturing of the food product understanding 
the, the THC component and what that is, but, you know, allergens, um, anything that, that could cause... Right, right, right. So basically, no allergen. It hasn't been associated to any allergy, these byproducts so far. Uh, once you have an ingredient, what we do in food, we use ingredients, okay? And once you consider this product an ingredient, it would follow the tradition that we have in food of understanding what are the potential hazards of that ingredient, okay? I don't think there are potential hazards uh, as long as you treat it. Uh, it's according to the food. It's according to how you prepare food, okay? The manufacturing itself. So remember, food safety relies on manufacturing practice, okay? Uh, in that one instance that I worked with a company that tried to do an actual infusion and was trying to use very little temperature because they didn't want to decarboxylate and release the product, the, the Department of Health in that state said, whoops, hold on a second, we have chances of, of Clostridium botulinum because you're not destroying a spore, you may have the, uh, the cells, the vegetative cells, when they have an opportunity, they grow and the toxin is produced in no time, right? And I said, yes, yeah, you're right. So that product was shelved. Uh, that would be one of the worst case scenarios. The others would be just a regular, you know, production based on what is the intended use as an ingredient. But remember, I don't see, I particularly don't see an incentive for a food company to, to use an ingredient like this for which they cannot have any claims. Because food are very limited. If there is anything where claims are going to be very, very, very remote, are going to be food. So you got to be very careful. And these companies are trying to position themselves about claims, and that's where you know I see that dietary supplements may allow them for that. And of course, drugs. Good any of the discussion this morning? center around potency issues? I mentioned briefly that this is an area where uh, if we go into dietary supplements and they're trying to do a claim, they're going to have to support that claim with some, you know, testing. And what I see is still with the testing with potency is quite a bit of variation. It's, uh, the methodology is still developing. The large variability in um, how they measure it. And so you may have some good uh, protocol for uh, identifying the, the analyze, the target, but quantification is still an issue. And since you are gonna go into potency, you need to have a quantification system that have a coefficient of variation that is small, and I think the industry is still struggling with that. But I'm not an expert about that. <laughs> I mean, that's what I see and some value that I, I have access to. Oh, when you're saying a quantification system, are you, um, are you does, that, does that have anything to do with uh, how much is a standard serving uh, of the, the, standard, of the that's, that's an issue. The standard serving is not, uh, hasn't been calculated, right? Because we are again talking about only less than 0.3% uh, of THC, but then if you want to do a claim about any effect, you're going to have to show that you have a drug and what is the product or the substance that you have in there, the compound. Uh, it's not for a small, I mean, testing for this type of uh, compound is not inexpensive. Uh, you know, people use uh, HPLC, there are systems that are complex, but the main issue with that is that, uh, and the farm bill is very strict on that, they want to have testing done in, in labs that have certifications, and dealing with the food industry for more than 20 years, not that many labs have that. <laughs> They are all over the map sometimes. So it's very important to have a standards and, and to create, you know, protocols that have been validated before you can use them. We are still going through that. 
Do you have any considerations or have you gotten involved in warning language or warnings on um, the food products? Do you have any perspective on that you'd like to share? Or no, that, that doesn't, right, that's more of a legal advice. My take from seeing the agency, how they behave with others, is that they have been kind of just using warning letters but not going too hard on the company. Yeah. Not stating CBD is prohibited. There they go, if you go into the warning letters, you start seeing a lot of association with good manufacturing practices, violations of that. Which, by the way, is probably still 80-90% of the warning letters are associated to violations of 21 CFR 117 subpart. Okay. Are there any additional questions from the subcommittee or from the CCB? I don't have any questions. Thank you, Omar. This actually answered quite a few of my questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Omar. Yeah. Dr. Levine and, and Ingrid will be able to share um, a PDF version of what Omar presented today. Um, and we thank you so much for your knowledge and your time. Um, and so now, uh, Julie, we are right at 10 till. If we have any comments from the public, um, we certainly uh, are open to those at this time. Public comments? Should I give a big point? You're welcome to stay. Um, You're welcome to stay. I, I don't think we have any public comment today. Okay. All right, Dr. Levine uh, and Ingrid, before we were to adjourn the meeting, and, I, and are there any additional thoughts or anything more you'd like to see on this subject? I will say, Dr. Levine, um, he did spell out very well um, many of the CFRs in the uh, presentation as it relates to this subject. Excellent. Mark, I think we can take it away. Um, we appreciate you so much coming in here today and speaking uh, with the subcommittee and the Cannabis Control Board and members of the public from Vermont. To remind everyone who may be watching this, if you would like to make a public comment, you may do so at ccb.vermont.gov with the public intake form. All comments received that way are submitted to the subcommittee members for their review, and we do uh, summarize and bring those up during our subcommittee meeting. So, Mark, if you'd like to close us out. Oh, thanks, Omar. Uh, if there are no further uh, comments or questions, then uh, uh, do I hear a motion to adjourn from one of the members? Make that motion. Thanks, Ingrid. Second. And a second? Can I, do we hear a second? Thank you, Mark. Uh, meetings adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks.